All right. Good to see each of you this morning. Again, let me uh, offer my uh, welcome to you. I've done that already, but I appreciate so much all of you being here. Beth and I have been gone. We are back and we'll be back now for several months and it's good to be home and uh, see all of you this morning. We had a good trip to Bowling Green. We were the good church, the Lost River Church there. And as I said in uh, the bulletin this morning, they kept me busy and I like being busy, but we thoroughly enjoyed our time and we were able to see Lots of folks that we know and love. So that was good. I appreciate Jeff and Brian speaking for me here last week. I know that you benefited from that as well. Next Sunday, Mark McCrary will be with us in our Sunday series. Uh, it's really the last event like that over the course of the year. Mark uh, preaches and serves as a shepherd as well for the church in uh, Doug the Douglas Hills in the Louisville area. And I appreciate him and have so much enjoyed his teaching through the years. And he will do a good job for us. And I hope that you will come. And I hope that you will invite someone to come with you. I've invited several. Don't know if uh, anyone will come. But, uh, but you never know until you try, right? So let's keep inviting folks this coming Sunday as Mark's going to talk to us about this concept of God so loved the world. The four lessons that he's going to present I think will be very good, very cohesive, and they will give, give all of us a really good idea of what God has done for us. And so I hope that you will make your plans, if you haven't already, make your plans to come and be with us. That's next Sunday. Uh, tonight, after the services, uh, the ladies are invited to our home for a class. And then tomorrow night, all of you are invited to our home for our monthly Ecclesiastes class. I hope that you'll, you'll find time to come to that. And then Tuesday night, the college class meets. So there's pretty much something for everybody over the next several days. So we hope that you'll make your plans to attend some or all of those classes that you can. Please do that. I want to mention one other thing before I get into the lesson this morning. Uh, I received a, a message early Saturday morning from Trimore to Zola. Trimore is one of two men that we're very interested in in terms of his work in Zimbabwe. And Trimore uh, told me that Taka is very sick. And uh, he not only told me what was wrong, but he told me, he sent me some videos. Taka is in the hospital, and he is very, very sick. We're not quite sure right now exactly what's wrong. Uh, he has chest pains. He, he's, uh, there, there are several factors that, that the doctors are trying to determine. But uh, I can tell by his text that Trimore is very concerned. And... Uh, that makes me concerned. I have grown very quickly to love Taka and try more. <clears throat> but uh, this church uh, is having a hand not only in his work, but we are also helping in his recovery, we pray. And so I hope that, uh, that all of you will keep Taka uh, Mukono in your thoughts and prayers. And I think it is very appropriate, if you would, as we think about him this morning, let's go to God in prayer on his behalf, please. Father, we ask in a special way this morning that you and your good care and compassion and, and help would look at Takas and help him, help the doctors and those medical professionals today that are attending to him. We're thankful, Father, for his work. We're thankful that we can have fellowship and help him in his work and help his family. We pray, Father, that you will, especially at this time, Give him the things that he needs to fully recover so that he might very quickly be about, continue to be about the business of teaching and preaching that he continues to do. Again, we ask in a very special way, and we come to you uh, as a group of believers who believe very strongly in the fact that you can intervene and will intervene in his life. So bless him and help him in every way this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please. Please keep him in your prayers because uh, this is on my heart and mind as I know it now will be on yours. And so uh, I hope that, uh, that he will make very significant progress very soon. But he is very sick. And I want all of you to please keep that in your minds. Well, our theme this year is widen your hearts. And we're talking about several aspects of that. And really the concept is that all of us need to grow. All of us need to be, if you will, wider. We need to, we need to, uh, to, to get stronger, to get better, to think about and to, to help in our Christian walk. And that's really what this idea is about. And we take the idea from 2 Corinthians 6. It's a passage which Caleb read for us this morning as he began the service. I want to read that to you again and then just make a few brief comments about that. Paul would say, okay. Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. Now in return for the same, I speak as to children, you also be open. 
You know, if there was a statement in Scripture by the Apostle Paul that deals with the relationship that we have with God and the relationship that we have with each other, this is the statement. And he, he's talking to them about the fact that they didn't believe that he was a true apostle. That's really what this entire book really, I think, finds as its main subject. And here he talks to them. He says, I want you to understand our, our hearts have been wide open to you. We've not held anything back from talking to you, from, from telling you, from showing you and giving you evidence that, no, I, I am a true apostle. And so phrases like, oh, Corinthians, like he says here, that, that's a statement that's really made. It indicates a, a personalized emphasis. You know, I, I, what do you call people from Florence? You ever thought about that? I don't know, Florentians? That's pretty close, huh, Gail? That's pretty close. Y'all right, act like y'all never heard that term before. I don't know. I, I just created the term. So if you'll call all us that, or, or Sholians, I guess, if you're thinking about the area, Sholzian. But Paul says, he talks about these Corinthians and he tells them, I'm calling you that because I want, I want to get your, I want to, to emphasize to you the fact that you need to hear what I'm saying. He called the Galatians, the Galatians. He called the Philippians, the Philippians. And those are the places where I think he emphasized that what I'm about to tell you is really that important. And I want you to understand that. So he speaks directly and bluntly as possible to them. And he points out, I think, especially in verse 12, when he would say, you are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. The problem, he says, is not me. The problem is not those of us who are apostles. The problem is you. We've given you plenty of information. We've shown you what you need to know and what you need to believe to know that we are true apostles. So the problem's not us, Paul would say. The problem is you. And he emphasizes that to them. He's getting their attention, and I think he does that in a very good way. So he's telling them, you are your own problem. Well, I want to I grab hold of that this morning as we think about that. And I want to suggest to us, folks, that most often we are our worst enemy. I think we all want to be better. We all want to, to walk in a way that's more pleasing to God or, or to use our, our theme. We, we all want to, to walk really more wide open. We want to, to, to do some things that, that make our walk and make our work more open to what God wants, don't we? All of us are like that. And sometimes the problem, and maybe most often the problem is not, not somebody else. The problem's us. We're the problem. And, and as Paul says, it's not us, it's you. And sometimes I think when we think about ourselves, we limit ourselves because we don't open our hearts and we're not as wide open to making ourselves better than maybe we ought to do. So I want us in the sermon today, I want us to think about this specifically in relations to each other, in relationship to each other. Do you fully comprehend the blessing that we are to each other? Just think for a moment if we didn't have this. So think of our faith this, this morning had to be expressed in some just personal way. And we didn't have each other. We, do, we didn't have this family that we call our College View family. And I want to suggest to us this morning that, that this blessing of family is, is one of the greatest blessings that we can have. But, but I want to suggest something to you. If you're sitting there this morning, you're going, Kenny, you know, I'm here but maybe I'm not as engaged as I ought to be. Maybe this is not the, the, the blessing that maybe it ought to be. I, I, I really want you to ask yourself, are you not your worst enemy? Might, might it be something that you need to change in your life? Might you need to redirect how you feel about, about what you are a part of? And, and again, I'm not indicting you. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty this morning. But I am saying to you, don't you think you may need to evaluate that? I think that's exactly what Paul was saying. You know, sometimes when you're feeling like you're feeling, you need to think about yourself and not think about everything else around you. Think about what the issue is with you. So, so this morning, really what I want us to do, I want to focus our idea this morning on, on how we view each other and the relationship and building our relationships with each other. And I think Romans 12 talks to us about that. I want you to take your Bible this morning and turn there, if you will. Now, before I, before I get into some evaluation this morning, I want to say this. I think one of the strengths of this local church is our relationship with each other. This is not, uh, this lesson is really more of a commendation. Because uh, I believe very strongly in this, and I want all of you to understand that. 
I think one of the strengths of this local church is the relationship that we have with each other. Now, some are stronger. We have personal relationships with some who are stronger. And what I want us to see this morning is that the stronger all those bonds become, the stronger each of these relationships become, the stronger we are together. And that's what I want us to think about again during this lesson this morning. And while we do have this strong bond, and while I do think it is one of our strengths, and while I believe probably most of you, if not all of you to some degree or another, feel that way about it, our hearts can be made more wide open toward our group. That's what I want you to think about this morning. Well, what is it that can happen in your life? I'm not talking about you thinking about somebody else. That's not what we're dealing with. We're talking about you this morning. I'm thinking about me this morning. What is it that I can do to help my relationship with every single one of you who are part of this church? I want you to do the same as we think about these things from Romans 12. In Romans 12, Paul makes some statements that are both personal and practical. And the statements are about how they treat each other. Some of them will be easily understood by us. Some of them we may say, you know, I hadn't really thought about that. But that's what I want us to do. I want us to turn to these passages and think about what it is that he says. Notice this in Romans 12. I'm reading from the New King James Version. He says, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. I love these sections of Scripture. They, they, they make for good sermon outlines, okay? But that's not really why I love them. I love them because they, they are short statements, really short phrases, and in, in some cases, maybe just short words that identify the very things that we ought to be engaged in. And as Paul begins to, to conclude this letter that he writes to the church at Rome, he says, these are things that need to happen within your group. And certainly what the application is for us is these are things that have to continue to happen, I would say, in our group. And they must increase. They must get stronger. So I would identify that by saying these are seven must for a church relationally. Now, there are a lot of things that need to happen in a local church. But the things that we're going to look at from this text this morning are things that practically help each of us have a better relationship with each other. They, they have to do with that. Now, I, I, I'm very well understand the fact that our first relationship is with God. I get that. that. That relationship has to be strong. But there is a relationship, and while it's not equal, there are things that identified in Scripture just as strong. In 1 John, John does that. He, you know, if you love God, you love your brethren. And if we're going to be the kind of people that say to God, we love you, then we're always going to have to be the kind of people that say, I love my brethren and whatever it is that I need to do to help that relationship, that's what I'm going to do. That, that's part of what makes a strong church, my friends. And these are some things that I think we must do. So let me, let me mention these seven things this morning from this text. And, I, and as I do that, I want you to, as I will do, I want us to evaluate that. And my guess is some of these you're going to say, I do pretty well at that. And some of these you're going to say, well, I don't do so well at that. And if that's the case, then we need to reevaluate and do better. Number one, let me suggest that we need to put others first. I want you to, if, again, if you're not there, I want you to turn back. I'm not, going to have, I'm not going to have the text on the screen. So it might be good at this point in time that you just take your Bibles and turn back to Romans 12. Because I'm, I'm going to refer to that again. Verse 10 tells us that we need to be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another. Every preacher has a series. 
And it's the one and other passages. We've had, we've had lessons not, too, not uh, many months from now, just, just really soon this last year, about, about how we treat one another and the relationship and the responsibilities that we have to one another. But we are to be, verse 10 tells us, kindly affectionate. Some translations say we need to be devoted to one another. Well, I want to ask you a question. Do you know the people who are in this church? You may say, well, Kenny, that's kind of a strange question. No, that's a serious question. Do you know the people who are part of this spiritual community? Do you, do you know who they are? Are you kindly affectioned? Are you devoted to those people? Because I think what the text tells us is that brotherly love recognizes our church as a family. I know how I feel about my physical family. I, I, I love them. I, I know how I feel about my children and my daughter-in-law and, and all those who have some re really relationship to me in terms of my physical family. But I want you to think about this family this morning. How well do you know this family? And, and what is your disposition toward people who are part of this family? This, this is the important part of the thing. That this is what brotherly love does. It gives preference to one another. And, and, and when that happens in a church family like this, let me tell you what we do. We pull together. When people have concerns, when people have problems, when people are dealing with issues in their life, we pull together. We give preference to those people. That, that's what it is. And so my question this morning to you is this. How much of that do you do? How much of that do you do? Putting others first. Listen, it takes time. It takes my time. And, and, and it's time that goes beyond the assembly. One thing I love about us is when we dismiss, it takes a little while to get everybody out of here. I think that's a plus. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's a good thing. I guess unless you're locking up the building. And then you get a little antsy about that. But that's a really good thing. But folks, that's not all of it. Saying hello to each other here, that, that, that's, that's, I think that's an incidental to the fact that we assemble and we come into our worship here and we want to be together. But if this is all of that you get, that's not near enough. That's not giving preference. That's, that's saying hi in an assembly. That's not really becoming part of the group. And it's a telling question. I think when you ask yourself, how much of yourself are you giving to this group? That's a telling question. And I don't know how that makes you feel. I'm going to say it to you this way. Are you giving or are you getting? Are you always the recipient of what happens in this church? Or are there things that you're willing to do to give of yourself to accomplish that? It's not just, you know, the leadership do this or the preacher do that or, or this group do that or that group do that. This is everybody's responsibility. We're to give preference to each other. We're to accomplish that for each other. And that, that, that doesn't come easily, probably. That may not even come easily in a, in a physical, earthly family. But folks, that, that, that's what God requires of us. If we're going to be a strong church re relationally, that's what's got to happen. And, and whatever deficiencies we see that we may have, we've got to do better than that. We have to do better than that. That's part of our responsibility. Listen, don't, don't continue to be a taker. Be, be willing to be a giver. And to put yourself in that position saying, you know what, others do that. That's what I need to do. That's what I want to do. That's what I will do. I will put myself in a better position to accomplish that. So that's a must that all of us, and th th that may be a very hard one for you to, to think about. I'm, I, I'm not suggesting that any of this is easy for us, for any of us. But I'm saying that all of us must think about what we're doing relationally to each other. And how much we can help with that. Secondly, let me suggest this. There needs to be some passionate involvement. I love these three phrases in verse 11. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. How do you, how do you really put that together? Think about that. Not lagging in spirit. Not, to, well, let me, not lagging in diligence, rather. Fervent in spirit and serving the Lord. All of those things really come together. It's, it's the idea of 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. And I'm just going to say it to you this way. I think all of that is just passionate involvement. Now I'm going to say it. First of all, how involved are you in what we're doing here? And secondly, how passionate are you about that? 
Or, or is your involvement, you know, Kenny, I come and I assemble and I, I, I certainly want you to do that. I, I think that's a critically important part. But we're talking, about, we're talking about moving past that, folks. We're not just talking about being involved from an assembly standpoint. We're talking about how passionate are you about being part of this group. And about the effectiveness that you as a person, because you can do things, you can be involved in ways, and you can help with things that I can't do or others can't do. Everybody has a role to play in that. So how much are you involved and to what degree are you involved in the activities that this group is a part of? That, that's a very, I think, a very critical question for us to ask. But it takes passionate involvement, folks. I tell you right now, what you're passionate about is what you spend most of your time doing. So you just need to ask yourself that question. Am I passionate about this or am I passionate about other things? Are the other things what take really the, the most time in my life? Is, is, that, is that where my focus is? And if that's the case, then this particular point probably needs to be something that you reevaluate. Where is my passionate involvement? Verse 12 tells us this, that you need to rejoice in hope and patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. And I think how I would package all that, if I was just going to do that, I would just simply say that you don't need to quit. And you don't need to quit amidst difficulties. You rejoice in hope. This is, this is a place where you have that kind of thing, right? Of, of all the things that happen in your life, may, may I say it to you this way? And I know I'm talking to people who, who, who some of you are facing some pretty serious difficulties. You're, you're dealing with some things. It might be things that are personal. It might be things in, in more of a family situation. It may be things with your work. It may be things in, in other relationships that you have. May I ask you this question? Where, where, where and with what group of people are you going to find greater ability to rejoice in the hope that your life can have by getting through those difficulties in a place like this, among people like this? I, I would think that that's part of why most of you have said this morning, I, you know, I want to be a part of that group. Because you see the value of that. And I think one of the great blessings is, is that, that when, when we go through difficulties, we can reach out to each other and we can take hold of each other and we can say, hey, I, I'm going to help pull you through. It's not going to be me. It's going to be the Lord. But because I'm a part of the Lord's body, because I'm a believer and because I know he helps those, I, I'm not going to let you quit. <laughs> I want to help you keep going. I won't let you do that. And I think I feel that way about you. That's what we need. I think one of my greatest blessings, quite frankly, is the fact that when I do struggle from time to time or when I, when I get down or, or when I feel like, you know, maybe, maybe life's not going exactly like it ought to or maybe like I want it to, I, I reach out. I, and there's plenty of you. Really, I think all of you. I, I wouldn't mind reaching out to any one of you and say, look, I need help. And I think that's a great blessing. And I want to encourage you to rejoice in hope to be patient in tribulation and continue in prayer. And I think, again, I, I guess we could, we could probably break all three of those down, but I just want to, want to combine that and say, just don't quit. And, and let this church, let those who are part of this church help you not quit. That's what I think Paul is suggesting to them. They, they were going through things that, that obviously were difficult for them. I don't know everything that these first century churches went through. We, we know they were, they were suffering persecution, most all of them. And again, I don't know everything that was involved with that, but, but I'll tell you what I see in Paul. In almost every one of his letters, what he says is, let your brethren help you. And may I suggest that this morning, to whatever degree we can, let us help you. Now that, that manifests itself in some more practical ways, which I think is really number four. We need to contribute and distribute to needs of brethren. Verse 13 says, distributing to the needs of the saints given to hospitality. What does the word hospitality mean? What does it look like? It looks like hospital, doesn't it? You're going, well, how do you get hospital out of hospitality? Well, just look at that word. It also looks like the word hospice. While we don't like to think about some of that, I, I don't know of an organization that is more giving than hospice in terms of some really secular organization. What, what a great opportunity toward 
the latter stages of a person's life to have a group come in that gives that kind of relief and help to a group of people or to a person who needs it at a very critical time in, in a person's life, not only for themselves, but for their family. What a, what a great organization that is. And even my family has benefited from that. And, and, and I see the value of that. But really, it's, it's the same root word as, as what he's talking about here with hospitality. It comes from that same word. And it means to provide rest and healing. May, may I say to you that you need to use what you have? I know all of it. The things that God has blessed us with, I know they vary. But may I just suggest that all of us need to use what God has given us to help those who may need rest. To help those who may just simply need help or to help those who simply may need healing. We need to use what we have. And, 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 and I think one of the great blessings again of this church is that I think we're willing to do that. I think that's, that's one of the greatest blessings that we have. And I would encourage you this morning, again, listen, listen carefully. If you don't do that like, like you know you should or like you know you want to, then reevaluate and readjust. Use what you have. We all need to be people who not only are givers, but sometimes all of us need to receive as well. And so you need to be people, and I need to be people who are not only willing to give, or not only willing to receive, but are willing to give as well. So contribute and distribute to the needs of the saints. Given, given to hospitality. Look at this fifth thing. This, this, is, this is maybe not something that we think about, but I think it's interesting that he, that he puts this in this particular list. He talks about in verse 14, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Anybody ever here persecute you? Now I want to be careful how I say this. But you know, when you're talking about a group of people who are spiritually intimate, who have a strong relationship with each other. Folks, sometimes things just don't go quite as planned, right? In June, uh, Beth and I will have been here seven years. Overwhelmingly, we have been treated better than we could ever even have expected. But not by everybody. There have been a few in six and a half years that Hadn't treated me like I was hoping that they would or that I thought they would or that I expected them to. And there may be some and probably are some who think about me and they go, well, you know, you know we, you've not treated me, Kenny, as I expected you to treat me. You've not handled my situation. We haven't had the relationship maybe as strongly as I would want that. Or, or maybe you've done something that, that made me be ill at ease. I, I don't know what the case may be. And these are, these are few things. Now, don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to make something bigger about this than it ought to be. But I am saying to you. I mean, in the midst of this list, Paul would say, bless those who persecute you. In other words, don't, don't return evil for evil. Because some of our brethren, listen, some of our brethren will persecute us. They will say things about us. That they might do something toward us. That, that's, that's not anywhere close to what a Christian would do. I have been, I think, a part of this on both sides. And I think what Paul would tell us is, is that I better, as much as I can, I need to check my attitude. I, I don't want to do things that would, that would harm the relationship. I want to do things that would help the relationship. Bless those who persecute you. That's, that's one of the hardest things in this whole list. Bless those who persecute you. i tell you what that'll do. That'll make you like Jesus Christ. If you, if you have the wherewithal to bless those who persecute you and do not curse. And I don't think if that's really the nature of that idea or not. I don't think it is. I think that's just the idea of, of, of don't, don't say something or do something that's going to make somebody feel ill about them. Don't, don't do that to them. So I think the point of that is, is check your attitude about that fast. 
So I think that's really all I need to say about that. But all of us, I think all of us can do better in that area as well. And then number six, I I would simply say that we need to emotionally connect. He says in verse 15, you need to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. That's a strong emotional connection, isn't it? Strong relationships, listen carefully, strong relationships attach emotionally. That's the nature of having a strong relationship. I I, I don't know uh, uh, of an association. I hope that you feel more emotionally attached to this group than you do the Rotary Club. I hope that you feel stronger emotionally attached to this group than you do the PTA. I hope that you feel more strongly attached emotionally than you do the people you work with. Listen, this is a relationship that's much deeper, that much, that's much stronger. But how emotionally deeply connected are you here? Now, I'm not saying that you invite somebody over and just cry with them for the sake of crying. But you know, there are opportunities for us to be together to help, to rejoice. And we need to be the person among our group that can help make that connection. And again, here's what I'm saying. I, I, I think we do, I, from my vantage point anyway, I think we do a good job of that. But my, my question this morning, and my reason for talking about this is, could we be better with that? Could, could we find ways to emotionally get stronger and to attach ourselves to each other better and not detach? That again makes for a strong church environment. And then finally, let me suggest this this morning, that verse 16, I think, just tells us that we're all in and we're all in together. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. And do not be wise in your own opinion. I think a hard thing sometimes. And, and maybe, it's, maybe it's hard from both sides. Maybe it's hard for someone who maybe thinks himself or herself, herself to be more important. And maybe it's hard for a person who thinks himself or herself to be less important. But here's the fact of the matter. In this environment, in, in a local church environment, there's not one person more important than anybody else. I want you to hear that very strongly. Now, sometimes the roles become more public, like a minister or someone who stands before a group of people on a regular basis who's seen because of the role he plays or or to act as a leader and a shepherd among God's people because of the responsibility that they have. But no one anywhere is more important in a local church than anybody else. That, That becomes clear from Scripture. And so, as you consider yourself this morning, understand that there are no titles in the church. There are no titles. There are responsibilities that different ones of us may play. But there are no titles. There's nothing that says this one's more important than somebody else. There are roles, and we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. I don't know how you see yourself in that. I don't know what difficulties you face in seeing yourself as as important to, to what we're trying to accomplish here. But I can promise you this morning, I can guarantee you that who you are, is critically important to what we're all about. I I appreciated so much this morning. Kenneth, in his prayer, took the time this morning. Do you remember what he did? He he, he talked about really a lot of roles that we have. And then he talked about how how, he was thankful for for the children that we have. And he was thankful for the young families. And he was thankful for all the, the older couples that we have. And I thought as I prayed with him, and as I thought about it, I thought to myself, that is exactly right. I, I am so thankful for those of you who are older even than me. And there are a few of you in this audience older than me. And I talked to a few of you this morning. You come and you don't feel like coming. You, you come because you gain a benefit. But, but know this, it's not just that you gain a benefit by coming. It's that I gain a benefit by you coming. I know, know there are people. I, I talked to some of you this morning before the Bible class started. I, I talked to some of you this morning, and, and, and even in the conversation, I can tell that, you know, it's not that you don't want to come, but, but you're, having, you're having to work through, you're having to push through to make yourself be here. And I know there are times when you can. I know there are times when you don't feel like it, but you, you have to understand this. Your presence does something that my presence can't do. 
or that the elders' presence can do, or, or, or others who are part of this can do. Your presence in this assembly as often as you can be here, when we all know you don't feel great. That, that speaks volumes about you. I, I cannot tell you how important that is. I, I, in, my, in my own personal life, part of what makes me not quit is because I see those who are dealing with much more difficult circumstances. It may be because of age. It may be because of personal issues. It may be because of other things. But they keep fighting and they keep pursuing it because that's who they are. And that gives me great confidence that I can do that as well. But there's an all-inclusiveness about us, folks. And I hope, I hope that none of you see yourself as less important than anybody else because you're not. And I don't say that just to try to make people feel good. I say that because that is exactly right. God looks at all of us the same. Now, again, we may have different responsibilities, but he looks at all of us the same. So I'm thankful that Kenneth took the time this morning to thank God for who all of us are and the fact that we're all together. It is a great blessing to have the mixture that we have. We have such age diversity here, and I think it's a great accomplishment. I, you know, I hear people all the time talk about the, the children that we have, and we're grateful for that, and we're grateful for the young families, and that is the case. And we have, we have those who are a little older who have some of that family stability, and we can all look at them and say, you know, that's going to help us. And then we look at those of you who are older. Some of you have lost your spouse. Some of you have been, it's been that way for a long time. Some of you, you you're, you're divorced. Or there are other reasons in your life that your family situations as is. I'm going to tell you. I, I, I say this a lot. But I think some of your circumstances, as difficult as they are, that they help me so much. Because they tell me, look, that's a faith that's strong. That's a faith that understands the value of their influence and the value of their opportunity and the value of their example. So you got to keep doing it, folks. You just got to keep doing it. And, and, and whatever influence that you do have, understand how tremendous it is and how wonderful it is for each of us. That, that's, that's what makes this church this church. And I'm not suggesting that we're the only ones who have it at all. I'm not suggesting it at all. But I'm saying this is the group that we're a part of. Listen, whatever it is that I and you and I can do to make ourselves more relational in this context, that's what we need to do. So evaluate it. Make some determinations and then go practice those things that you come up with. That, that will not only make you better, but it will make us better. And that's always what we're trying to accomplish. I'm thankful for this local church. And I hope that our hearts would be made wider in the relationships that we have with each other. May God help us toward that end. Well, if you have a spiritual need this morning that we can help you with, we're always wanting to do that. We appreciate the fact that you're here. That, that says that you're interested in spiritual things. But as you evaluate yourself this morning, you, you may be in a situation where you're not right with God. Let us help you with that. We, we, we'll help you by pointing you to God. We, we'll help you by doing what we can to, to encourage you and strengthen you and do what we can. So if you need prayers this morning to help you spiritually, or if you need to give yourself to God in, the very, in an initial way by believing in Him and being willing to repent of your sins and confess His name before men and then be willing to be buried in baptism so that your sins can be removed from you. We would, we would love to assist you in that. If you have a need, come as we stand and as we sing.